Next up, I'm joined again by Andy Fry from MIPCOM News. Hi, Andy. Hi, mate. You okay? Yeah, I'm very well. We're going to be talking about all the news coming out of the Quasette in our daily News from the Floor roundup. So what are the big stories, Andy? Well, should we start with Donald Trump? Um, why not? Why not? Uh, why he's not? the man of the moment, isn't he? Um, well, hopefully not. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a session tomorrow talking about um, uh, whoops, the Variety editor, Ramin Satude, who's going to be talking about his interviews that he's done with Trump over the years. So I think that'll be quite entertaining. Um, but there's also a story today about a documentary which has been distributed by Alter International. Uh, it's produced by 72 Films, and it's basically looking around the criminal conspiracy trial that's been attached to Trump. And it's sold very widely. They've had a, a, good, a good market in terms of getting out to international buyers. And I think that says a couple of things. Obviously, documentaries need to be high quality. Uh, they need to be of the moment, you know, if they can attach themselves to a big news event and have big names attached. Um, there's another one coming out later in the week, different kind of thing, which is um, from Fremantle, and it's uh, Martin Scorsese giving his own unique take on the saints, um, you know, sort of the, you know, the, some of the major apostles, like Joan of Arc and various others. So I think if you, if you want to be in that kind of factual game, you need to have something that really stands out. Yeah, yeah. So mega docs are essentially still still selling. Yeah, they're still selling. They're still selling, but you know they have to have you know something special about them. Yeah. Um, aside from that, I think I think drama is still a uh, big talking point. Um, we were talking yesterday about um, about risk aversion, and I think one manifestation of that is that um, a lot of distributors I've spoken to in the last month or two have have said that English language drama is really in demand. Now, if you remember three or four years ago, we talked a lot about demand for German, Scandi, Italian drama. Uh, now I'm not saying those don't sell, they still sell, there's, there's strong markets for them. But right now with this, this need for security, uh, English language, language drama is doing very well. And, and I think that's manifested in a few ways. Um, a lot of sales for Fremantle's Night Sleeper, uh, which uh, performed well in the UK and then sold to TF1. And, and that has been enough of a recommendation for it to, to go on to sell around the world. Uh, so lots of sales news around that today. Um, interestingly, I think there's also a uh, good scope for Australian and Canadian drama to, to sell. Um, so a show called Critical Incident has just been sold. Um, Australian show been sold back into Hulu in the US by, by all three media. Uh, there's another show called Sullivan's Crossing, which uh, is a Fremantle show, which is Canadian, selling well around the world. So I think this English language push is not just benefiting American shows or British shows, it's benefiting all English language shows. Yeah, so we, we really are seeing a bit of a retrenchment to, to safety across broadcasters. And it was something that Guy Bisson yesterday from Ampere Analysis was talking about, you know, that, uh, that you know, that attitude to risk is, is, you know, is really sort of front of mind for a lot of broadcasters. Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, as I say, it doesn't mean if you have a high quality show, in any language it will sell i mean there's a market for it but there is this retrenchment i mean there's a, a good this advert again from the magazine for a show called costiera uh, which is um, a Fremantle show uh, this is uh, a show set in amalfi um, tells the story of um of a guy who who works in a hotel as a fixer in amalfi and it's an english language show now Fremantle could have made that in italian they own italian production companies it's set in italy they could have done it a different way but i just think at the moment english language is is in demand and there was another one today, um, uh, Beta have um, a show called uh, The Couple Next Door, which has been on Channel 4 uh, in the UK, done very well and is now selling globally. It's an English language show based on a Dutch format. So I think, again, that process of Dutch format to English language show, 50 sales around the world. So I, I do think that, that there, there is a demand for that at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, in terms of um, your busyness at, at the market, mm. I mean, has it, been, has it been a busy market for news? I, I think it it's it's busy. I mean, but I I think as we were saying yesterday, it's not always about deals. It's sometimes about insights. It's about what's coming out of conferences. It's about messaging as much as deals. Um, so I think um, the keynotes we we referenced upcoming keynotes yesterday, and a couple of those have happened now. And I think uh, Channing Dungay in her keynote, um, she she made a couple of points that are really interesting. She said that w Warner Brothers Television, which is not historically done co-productions in a big way is really keen on co-production. So that is a reflection of the financial challenges in the market. You know, big Hollywood studio actively going to the international market and looking for co-production, which mm. is quite new. She also said that uh, procedurals are on their way back. 
you know, procedurals have never quite gone away, but, you know, for a period of time, we've had those limited series, eight parters, you know, will it go to second season? Uh, and now she's saying that those episodic story of the week pieces are, are really back in demand. And procedurals, again, are, are an indication of a market that is looking for safe bets. Um, and then Tony Vincequera, very interesting guy. He's helped turn around Sony, Sony Pictures Entertainment uh, in his seven years there. Uh, he picked up the Variety Vanguard Award yesterday. Um, he predicts a couple of years of, of continued chaos. You know, he thinks there's going to be a lot, of, lot more pain for the next two years. But his, his positive, upbeat message is that at the end of that two-year period, people will still want ent entertainment. Once all of the disrup disruption has died down, then there'll still be a business. You know? yeah. So it's about clinging on. Well, it's a long time to cling on two years, <laughs> isn't it, in this industry? It's, uh, it feels like uh, uh, you know, way over the horizon, but it's, it's not really, is it? It's only 24 months. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I think, uh, unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of people in every link of the chain have already suffered quite badly. Yeah. But, um, but you're right. I think, I think the message is you know, it, it's just about resilience. You know, it's about trying to stay, stay the course. And it, as we were saying yesterday, the big companies with, with catalogs, with access to networks, with with long long standing relationships are, are going to do well. I mean, I know that um, ITV Studios, for example, they've they've re re geared their business in the last couple of years around the the notion of of being client facing. Of so, it's not about the deal; it's about the client relationship. Uh, and they just announced a renewal of a partnership with Seven Australia. So that's a 25 year old relationship which they've now renewed. So that's not just about saying, oh, here's our drama, take this. That this is about saying, here's our catalog, here's what's coming up. What solutions can we provide for you? So it's a different way of thinking, which which favours the bigger companies that that can offer, you know, any any number of different ways of segmenting this business. Yeah. Now we've got uh, Evan Shapiro coming on the the show uh, a little bit later today, so we're really looking forward to catching up with Evan <laughs> again and uh, and hearing some of his insights. He's been in the uh, innovation hub, hasn't he? Uh, down in the down in the bunker, and uh, there's been a few sessions that he's been leading. Um, have you caught caught any of those? Have you got any insights from what he's uh, said up to this point? Yeah, I mean, I've I've caught some of Evan yesterday and today. I mean, obviously he's coming up. He's uh, he's very good at you know saying his piece. So I won't, you know, I won't attempt to do what Evan does well. Um, but one of the key messages, he, he spent some time with Justin Sampson of Barb. Uh, Barb is the, the measurement agency in the UK, very good at what it does, similar to Nielsen in, in the US. Um, and they dissected data. And one of the most interesting pieces of data is that 16 to 34s in the UK, uh, when you look at their viewing behavior, 80% of their viewing, 80% of their viewing is now either streaming or social. Wow. Broadcast is like 10%. Yeah. When they broke it down by platform, the top platforms uh, in order of priority was something like, I think it was YouTube first, Netflix second, TikTok, the BBC. So the BBC is sitting there providing 10% of audience to, um, to the 16 to 34 demo. So, you know, Evan kind of rightly raised this provocative point. What does that mean as, as these kids get older and they become politicians and decision makers? What does that mean for the license fee, you know, for mm. media policy and so on? If the BBC is only hitting 10%, you know, do they still need to take two, three billion pounds a year? I'm sure they'll say they do, but yeah. I, I think it, it's going to be a, a much more live issue. Yeah. Um, well, I've never, I'm, actually, that's a, that's a stunning figure, isn't it? And, and I think everybody in the industry who's, who's got kids and uh, of, a, of, of uh, that sort of teenage, uh, teenage years already knows that, but I don't think we've ever seen it laid out in such stark terms, have we? Yeah, 80% is massive. And, um, and he was saying that's one of the reasons we're beginning to see broadcasters actually going to YouTube to, to distribute their content. So Channel 4 um, puts long-form programming on YouTube, and that's hitting a new audience, an additive audience that they're not, they're not reaching just through broadcast. So I think he said like 0.6% share um, of Channel 4 viewing comes from the viewing that they get via YouTube. So, I, I mean, you can like you can you can see YouTube as uh, as a destroyer of the business or an opportunity to to, to find new ways to audience. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's certainly a destroyer of the uh, of the um, uh, traditional business, if you like. And I think you know it, it looks like in maybe those two years that uh, that Tony Vincequera was talking about. You know, maybe th when we get there, the the landscape will look much much different, right? And YouTube. Yeah sounds like they're going to be a much more powerful player than they are now even. Absolutely, and I, and I suppose just segueing, um, the other thing, the, the FAST Summit, the FAST and AVOD Summit has been on today, 
Um, so it's been a very hot subject for a couple of years. I think everyone has, you know, who's had any content has been out there launching channels. And um, there are a couple more deals announced today. Uh, Blue Ant have extended their relationship with Pluto TV. So they've got um, Love Nature and, and one of their, their home channels uh, into the US. Um, and Wild Brain, uh, they've launched a Pokemon channel. Uh, and a couple of other kids' channels based around IP like Strawberry Shortcake. So there are still people coming to market, launching fast channels. But I, I think we're in a different game now. I think we're at a point where there are lots of fast platforms, lots of fast channels, and it's going to be about um, attrition to some extent. I mean, it's got to be about consolidation of the platforms. Uh, some of the channels simply not making it, not being good enough, not having enough, you know, enough content enough marketing announce or investment to, to survive. So I think we'll see a more sober period. I think Fast is obviously growing. And if you talk to any Fast executive at the BBC or ITV or the bigger companies, they still love the business and they think there's going to be a lot of ad revenue to be generated. But I think there's going to be some fallout. Uh, so again, you know, interesting dynamic. It's, you know, it's an opportunity for, for businesses to make more money. But, you know, it, it, ex exactly who's going to be the winners, it's, it's quite difficult to tell. Yeah. So looking ahead to the rest of Tuesday and on to Wednesday, Andy, what, what do you expect to, to see coming out? I know there's there's a few more keynotes to happen, aren't there? And there's a, there's a, a lots of uh, other panel sessions as well. So what, uh, what are going to be the things that you're watching out for over the next day and a half? Um, well, there's, um, there's a Dan Cohen... Um, a keynote later today that's paramount so i think that's going to be about very much about paramount's content licensing so they're very much in the business of doing third-party deals not just sucking up all the content for their platform so i think it'll be interesting to see him add some flesh to the bones on that subject um one thing i'm quite interested in which i mean i, I just spoke to them yesterday um it's not 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 necessarily the biggest commercial story of the market but um there's a nigerian company here called accelerate who are screening a documentary this afternoon, which is about the decolonization of Africa. Um, <coughs> and as they were saying, um, that's pretty much the first time anyone has told the story of decolonization mm. from, from an African perspective. Mm. Um, so I, I think, you know, it would be great to see them get a deal on that show. You know, you know hopefully that show can get on a global platform or, or the producer is telling me she'd love to see it on the BBC. And it, it seems right that that's where it should be, so people can actually, you know, see what decolonization was about. Yeah. And they they were very fortunate; they got lots of senior figures, people who were around at the time, who are now in their seventies, eighties, nineties, to talk about that period. A um, couple have died since the film was made, so in a way, it's an important historical document. Mm. So I think that's interesting. I mean, coming back to the the programming. Uh, I, there was a screening of uh, Rise of the Raven yesterday, and I, I think there is um, interest around period pieces still, big period pieces. That that was um, a Hungarian-led piece, so it's about a Hungarian hero, but the, there was another one I was looking at. Um, there's a period piece about Mozart as well, and some Turkish drama in the market, so I think big historical pieces are still uh, of interest. And I noted with interest that, that Beta have had quite a lot of success selling... Um, a show called Maxima, which is um, it's a relatively contemporary um, royal uh, story. It's a dramatization of um, of a princess, um, I think, from Holland, but I could be wrong. So, apology to royal viewers. <laughs> um, but it struck me as interesting that, that we've done the ro royals to death as a historical period subject, mm. but with the crown looking at Diana and with Maxima coming out of Holland, maybe the, maybe there's a moment in time for more contemporary royal stories, maybe a revisit of Grace of Monaco or, or yeah. some of the other you know, more glamorous romantic love stories. May, maybe there's a moment for that as well. Interesting. Andy, thank you so much for, for joining me again. Uh, we look forward to doing the same thing again tomorrow yeah, for day no three. And, uh, and, and good luck uh, catching everything. I know you're dashing around all over the, uh, the croissant and in the palais. So thanks very much Absolutely. again for that. Um, we'll see you again tomorrow. So we're going to take a short break for some messages from our sponsors. And we'll be back soon with Solange Atwood from Serial Maven Studios as we hear about her new business. Stay tuned.